Hello everybody, this is Mecca of Misfit Artist, and today we are going to be talking about Mike Mignola for the two reasons of one, he seems like a really cool guy with a cool style, and two, Misfit Artist, uh, Ace and I, we have been taking a lot of inspiration from him recently for a few different reasons. So here I have a little mood board of some of his stuff collected, and we're just going to kind of talk about it, and I feel like... The takeaways, that I'm not going to say that I'm going to be diving into everything about his style. I'm not going to tell you how to draw like him. If you want to learn how to draw like him, study him yourself. Do what I've just done. Google and collect some of your favorite pieces of him and try to get what you want out of it. What I'm going to be telling you is what I think can be taken into any art style and has given him some pretty decent success. And the three main things are that he has, you know, his very, some very strong shapes. And, sorry, good understanding of composition and framing and clarity. As much as is going on in these pieces, it's all very clear. He's not overcomplicating any of his work, I don't think. And again, this is all, a lot of this might be opinion based, but, you know, this is what I'm getting out of him. So, the first things is obviously, you know, if you look at Hellboy or how he does character designs, a lot of it gets simplified. A lot of people can try to draw a head, you know, with all the guides and everything. You know, if it's an anime style, you're going to have this little cheek bit poke out. You know, it's going to swoop up. And to replicate a lot of styles, you have to hold yourself to a lot of these guides. The eyes are always a big thing. There's a thousand different ways to draw eyes. You know. So you have all this. But if you look at a Mike Manola piece, you still want to make sure that your center line, your eye lines are relatively there. But in practice, the head is really quite simple. I mean, look at that. That's... And then to get his... I mean, here he literally just shadowed in the eyes. And this part here, the way that his shadows will all kind of start to blend into each other in a very fascinating way. The hair on this character is literally becoming the shadow of the face. That right there, I think, is the key to it. Because obviously Mike Minola, uh primarily a comic artist not only is he a comic artist but he is a comic artist you know that started you know a little bit before digital stuff became you know the big deal that it is now and i'm sure that anyway i'm not trying to get into the history of him necessarily but i'm sure he's embraced computers in his own way but a lot of things if you look at, at even the old marvel or dc comics a lot of techniques were developed because of the limitations that they had printing ma- making these things in mass so your co- the colors they worked with were relatively limited that's one of the reasons why cross hatching you know is and cell shading is such a big deal that it is as opposed to actual gradient you know gradients and such you know it was cheaper and easier for them to do screen tones and these kind of techniques than it was for them to mix complex colors they could technically but wouldn't have been nearly as easy so yeah like i said think about how you want your shape language to be and again he very clearly you know has the shapes that he uses i mean everything is kind of bulky and that's probably because he could draw that faster it was it's faster to do this number than to, you know, get your complex cube worked out here. And not say one way is better or worse than the other, but if you're doing something that has a lot going on with it, you know, if you're animating, for instance, and you're having to do this over and over again, at some point you're going to want to simplify things down. If you're doing a comic book where you have, you know, 
two, three, four panels on it and you have 20 pages, you got to start moving quickly. And you can make it more detailed later. A lot of production is just choosing where to stop. But when you start, you need to keep things simple. And sometimes when you keep it simple throughout the rest of it, you know, you get a very unique thing going on here. Even here, where, you know, there's you start to get a little bit more complexity, you know. You can see a little bit of a gradient or some softer shading going on down here. It's still easily recognizable from this key shape. Even this little guy. You can pick out so much when you use these simple shapes. You know? And the parts that stick out, like even past the characters. You know, there's something very easily identifiable going on here. Obviously, it's not as good as the actual illustration that we're, that he came up with, but again, that's the root of it, I think. So that's, like I said, recognizable slash simple shapes. Very important. The next part here is his really great composition, you know, and there's a few, a few things that we can go off of. Character, relatively in the center of the frame. Boom. That's I mean that that's simple, you know. We we if something's centered, that's going to draw a lot of attention. We also have our rule of thirds. Which again, will mean that, you know, a character is lined up in that center box, but he's not just in center. He's dipping. You can see how we have dark for a majority, one, two, three, four of our uh, rule of third blocks are covered in dark black shapes. Two more are at least partially covered in it, more so and more so. So you're making sure that your frame, even if your focus is centered up and visible, you don't want the rest to be boring. So he fills a lot of it in. You know, the head isn't half and half in one of them. Head's not here, it's not here, it's not here. It's solidly in one of those rule third blocks. Some people will also say that you want your thirds the eye line to end up on your thirds, that starts to get into a little bit more here. Now these guys, if we break up our rule of thirds, they're not up here. They're shorter. So they are only taking, the characters are only in the bottom two uh, middle of them. But it's very strong. You can see if they take that up, the rest of the frame is dedicated to this beautiful bone and texture work. And obviously, past that, here with Conan, if half the frame is this beautiful background environmental work, we have him coming out of that shape. So you still have, again, simplifying it down, the composition has a very clear idea going on. Same with this guy, except he's kind of the inverse. If a majority of the frame is our character shape, more shapes behind him are helping to kind of point you to him. It's like, this shape is really like, hey, look at this guy, look at this guy. And the shadows are continuing to lead you to the focus. And one of my favorite things, and a lot of his uh, help by comics and everything, he'll do this kind of uh, like blocky, or not blocky. He he basically draws a frame within the frame. 
and then his characters stick out, you know, from that. I mean, it's it's obvious there. He's literally, like I said, he's constructing his own frame. And if you do that, again, you're basically hammering home where you want your someone to be looking. And we tried that a little bit here. It's not a Mike Mignola style necessarily, but again, you're, there's something to learn from it where we went ahead and we made a sketch where this circular gate, we popped our character in there. We made sure that the foreground had its own kind of framing and even stuff in the background so that this character, if there's something darker in the background, then the light thing will stick out. It brings your attention there. Whether it's geometric shapes, and un, you know, use of value, you know, all of these things will help your composition out. And I, I would argue that Mike Mignola has done that amazingly. Now, the other main tidbit here is, like I said, his simplicity and clarity. We all know that if you're drawing hair, you can go into major detail. You, know, you can start getting the strands. You can pick out where the part is, have more little fleckies come off. You can start going in with edge lighting to the character. I mean, you can do so much. And Mike Mignola kind of stops at a certain point even with his texturing i mean like we all think of his texture work and it, it does like he, he does exactly what he needs to do but like really he's just doing like little macaroni strands here <laughs> but it's enough it makes him feel a little bit more grungy a little bit more rugged even if we come here if you, if you zoom out this feels like such a textured piece and i'm not saying it isn't but if you look at it, it's just more little pen work. It's not like he's going in and, you know, adding scuff to this little metal or anything. But that's not to call him lazy, obviously. He's doing exactly what he needs to. Because when this is lesser, this feels like more. You know, you notice that. And I think that's really kind of the, the, the key to it all. There's a... And again, we're trying to learn from it. We're not doing great. I'm, I'm obviously not saying that we draw like Mike Mignola. That would be very blasphemous. <laughs> but... There's definitely been some things lately where... You know, I've thought about these rules. Here. You know, could this illustration be better if I actually had stars and moons back there maybe i'm not can't say that it wouldn't be but is it necessary when i'm doing however many more scenes of this i don't think it is you just need to have character character and these two characters frame up this guy we have two very different color palettes and then this very purple color palette coming in you know the trees and the vines are just abstract shapes uh, there's another one I did where I literally just blacked out uh, the sky right here. So you have, you know, a little bit bit of ground and then the black night sky up there. And then that nice moon, which again, when you put something bright on black, that contrast is going to tell you where to look. You know, and again, I'm like, as far as an illustration goes, this could be much better. But for the animation, it is. Again, it's simplified. It's what it needs to be. So, a couple of little notes I have here. Um, the black shadows make the clear shapes, even when coming out of a relatively black mass, all the more clear. When he shades, and this is what I think most people really know him for. So, if we go in, and we kind of just really roughly pick out some of what's going on. And see how much of this I can do 
in one stroke, really. So again, when his shape is already so well defined, a lot of the shadows are connected. Anything that isn't is adding more depth to itself. Because it shows that it's popping out or there's another mass going on there. So if I turn off, you can still pick out a lot of like a lot of that character's silhouette, even though part of it is just kind of falling into this mass here. Because again, all those shadows are fun and cool shapes, but they're made to complement the shapes that are already there. Same if we do the same idea to this guy. Again, just really quickly. And this is one of the concepts in itself. Anything clarity means that even if it's lower resolution or if it's sloppier, it still maintains some of that clarity. So if if your detail can only be read at the highest resolution or if you do it very painstakingly, it's probably not actually that clear. And that's that's a, a loose rule of thumb. You know, there's more to it than that. But especially if you're a beginner, let that be a little rule of thumb for yourself. Because then, I mean, like this shape obviously is ha like half the screen. But all you need really are these shadow shapes. And you can see the majority of this care of uh, the the shots silhouette really, and the, and that's the thing. If you have a good scene or shot or illustration, you should be able to make it just the shading, and still see what's going on. So if we do the same exercise, to this guy again, and again, I, and I'm taking away a lot of his little more minor flex you know, the, the fleck pieces that are going on there. Give just a little bit here, have his little tie. And I'm, again, I'm going to take away a lot of the detail that we have here. You're, you can still see a lot of it, especially as you zoom out. It all becomes that much more clear. And again, you can take these concepts and even in a piece where you're not necessarily trying to replicate his style... If you're thinking about things like this, you can make his style work for you. Let me find one of the things I recently did. This little guy here. If I turn off the main character, I'll turn off the line work and all that. You can see a lot of his main shapes. And this is even like my comfortable style. This is a very chibi art style I was rolling with here obviously. And what the way I shade is I have um, a clipping mask layer where if you look down, uh, you can see it there. It's a layer that I fill with a tone and then I pick out my shapes from that that I need to highlight. Or sometimes I'll fill it in the other way, but still it's, it's always clipping masks to my flats. So in doing that though, again, I know especially because it's my character, even when I'm doing it in a a slightly less comfortable style. I know, you know, I'm going to have his chest be fairly defined. So I need a, a square there. His body's going to come down here. So again, the character design can be broken down into the simple shapes, which is a very standard thing anyway. And I simplified it even more because I was doing a chibi style of the character. So we already have a pose. Simple. Simple shapes. And if I, you can see how, again, most of these, this shading, one, obviously falls into a mass, you know. So if I come back here, and I don't go onto that layer, but you can see how much of my shading is all connected in one Big shape. And 
And that's half the character right there. This one has to be broken from that because the light is hitting, you know, over here are the big parts of what make his style work, at least in the ways that people think about it. And again, when it comes down to it, a lot of these are very general principles um, that you should be thinking about anyway. Another thing here that I wanted to mention is just, again, a lot of these probably came from him working in comic books that he was traditionally inking, and then he had to mass produce and print, which meant that there were limitations that he was working with. But those limitations, he made work for him. So, again, I imagine that as he develops, he's still going to fall back on some of those classic things he picked up on. When you limit yourself to two extreme values, light, dark, black, white, dark, blue, bright, red, whatever, and they contrast, they will contrast from each other extremely. And that contrast is what's going to make it look really, really cool. I mean, even when you look at Mike's uh, flats, most of his flats, if I do some color picking, so obviously black, very dark. If I pick the skin tone off of Conan over here, it's pretty, it's really, um, I, you can't see the window because the way I capture, but it's in the upper half of the value. And it's not like blown out white or anything, but then if you come in and pick the frogs, it's also pretty high up there. You know, there's almost this, the blue skulls in the background there are a little darker, but it's not meant to contrast from the black anymore. It's still contrasting from Conan. Same thing down here. We have a bright red. And when you put it up against white, it still feels darker because white is the brightest value. But when it's next to black, no matter how dark these colors are, they almost feel like they're glowing. Because he's not shading those as much. So they always feel like they're jumping out from that black void. Uh, I don't know how much I'll edit this video. Uh, <laughs> I, but I hope to put this up in some short formats as well that you guys can save for quick tips. But I hope you guys enjoy this. If you do, please comment other artists that you maybe recognize in our work. Or just want to be like, hey, I have no idea what's going on here. Help me out. And we can try. I mean, you know, that's what we do. But again, I don't want to necessarily go over the history and everything about these artists, but what are the things that you know you look at and you want to pull from them so that you can make your drawings better? This isn't about drawing like Mike Mignola. It's about taking what his what I think are his biggest and most quickly identifiable traits are. And when you mash those together with what he does, what what Ethan Becker does, what this artist, what Gendy does, then you start making your art style and you find what you like to do and you start making something new and something beautiful. So until next time, stay safe, stay weird, keep drawing. Bye-bye.